Let's go ahead and get started here. Yeah, so my background is in chemical engineering. I had a, a career in R&D where I did process and material development, web handling, converting, and I did modeling simulation and data analytics. Uh, I was involved with the Web Handling Research Center at Oklahoma State. And about the past uh, two and a half years, I've been doing consulting on manufacturing processes, particularly in converting processes. What I'd like to cover this morning is a little bit of background on Maple Sims Web Handling Library. As Alex said, I have some recent experience with it. And I used it to try to uh, make some cases for, from my experience, what some common issues are with web handling and to see how the simulation might uh, help illustrate solutions for those problems. And after I cover those things, we'll have time to have questions and answers. So first of all, some background on what this web handling library is. If you're not familiar with Maple Sim, it's a simulation, some simulation software that has a number of libraries in it for simulating systems. Um, and these libraries include things like mechanical, uh, electrical, thermal, magnetic libraries. And, and they all have components in them that you can link together to define a system. And until recently, uh, there was no such specific web handling library, but MapleSim has created one. And this library of components involves uh, several items that are common to web handling systems. And for example, you can define uh, the mechanical properties of a web, things like modulus, thickness, etc. cetera. Uh, you can define web spans, which are the regions between rollers. And there's a variety of rollers, including you know, idler rollers or driven rollers, SRAP rollers or NIP rollers. And then you can feed the system with sources and take web away with sinks. And these can be represented either as unwinding rolls or winding rolls, uh, or simply you can define things like tension and velocity into the system and out of the system. A relatively new uh, item that MapleSoft has added is the ability to model laminating of webs. So you can have multiple uh, webs coming together commonly in a NIP. And then there are sensors that may be added to the system, um, such as angle sensors or load cells, let's say, for measuring tension. And then for you to be able to make uh, things like uh, dancer arms or accumulator systems or other mechanical items. There are some primitive elements borrowed from some of the other libraries in order for you to, to simulate uh, machines. So as an, just a simple example of what you can do with this library, this is the one of the outputs of a simulation in MapleSim, it's simply an animation of a system. And in this case, we have an unwind, uh, a spring-loaded dancer arm, a few idlers, and one driven roller. So it's a very simple system, it's five spans. There is a feedback of the position of this dancer arm to the motor. And if we watch this animation, you can see basically the the web unwinding flowing through the process. And while this is not a finite element model, it, it, it at least is showing you uh, mechanically what is happening in that very simple example. Now that's the output. The input in MapleSim would look something like this. And at first glance, you, it looks like a lot, but they're just simply these components that we talked about. There is a, the unwind on the left-hand side. Um, in the upper left corner, there are the web properties and some other properties in a property block up there. Then you have the idlers, you have um, the driven roll at the exit and it has a ramp 
that you can see this uh, the square block with the uh, ramp on it. Um, I'm going to try to see. Oops, sorry. Um, I was going. I'm sorry about that. I was going to try to use the pointer, but I'm just going to move <laughs> move on. So all of these things are linked by spans. Each of the spans has, or several of us have these uh, sensor outputs for the tension. And then we also see a feedback loop of the position of the dancer arm <clears throat> with a control loop back to a break on the unwind. So they're also simple elements. They're, they're linked together. Uh, the position of all the rollers is set by these fixed elements. So their position in 3D space. And when you run this simulation, after it's all connected, one of the outputs, for example, could be a plot like this. Uh, so you're looking at the dynamics of the system um, over time, the tensions in each of the spans. And it looks sort of like a first order response um, where eventually, uh, because of the ramp up of the driven roller speed, the, the tensions do level out after you know five to ten seconds um, there is a difference in tension for each span and that's because of the the bearing drag on each of the rollers and we'll talk about that uh, bearing drag effect on tension uh, later but you also see the dynamics in terms of the the length of the spans affects also when the when the system gets to uh, its steady state response so since tension is so important in web handling, you know, this kind of dynamic simulation gives you insights into what, what is happening during things like transients for line ramp ups or ramp downs or um, splicing events, et cetera. Uh, similarly, other outputs that the simulation had uh, set up because of the sensors was what in, on the left-hand plot, you know, what sort of braking torque was required in order to keep the, the dancer in a fixed position. And on the right-hand side, it's simply showing you a plot of how the, the roll radius is changing with time, the unwinding roll radius. So you're not limited to these plots, it's whatever kind of sensors you believe are needed to gain insight into the process which in a simulation is much easier to do sometimes than in a physical system where placement of a sensor may be difficult or, or expensive. So that was just a quick introduction to the MapleSim library. Now I'm going to show several examples using it on some common challenges that you may face in web handling systems. So we're going to talk a little bit about loss of traction or, or web slippage on rollers. We'll talk about cases where you might get uh, low tension in a web path. Uh, we'll show an example of curl in laminated webs. And then finally, we'll define what we mean by troughs and wrinkles in webs, uh, since that's a very common, very common issue for web handling. So first, speaking about traction loss on rollers, why are rollers used in web handling systems? Well, obviously, they're to get the web from point A to point B, and that usually involves uh, changing its position in space or its orientation in terms of uh, which side is up or down. And the whole goal is to get it to these, uh, say, money-making transformational steps in a process without damaging it. Um, for driven rollers, where let's say uh, a drive is connected to a roller or through through belts or, or pull, belts and pulleys, it's to control the web's velocity and indirectly then its tension and potentially position in machine direction. There are specialty rollers that are used sometimes to flatten roller uh, webs out where there are wrinkles, spreader rollers, we'll, we'll call them. And in other cases, you may have nip rollers that are used for bonding webs together, say in a lamination process. In all of these cases, most of the time, we want to have control of 
the web position and we want to have good uh, interaction between the webs and the rollers in terms of traction. Uh, similar to hydroplaning in your car on a wet road, that's usually undesirable and so is uh, slipping in, in web position. It can affect things like print registration where you have you know, multi-stage color printing or if you're trying to align webs laterally, say in a lamination process, uh, that web steering is important. And if you have slippage, you can also have things like uh, damage to the web if it's a film, you know, film scratching is a problem, or you can literally wear coatings off of uh, surfaces and rollers, you know, if the web is slipping. So the uh, slipping web can also damage equipment. Or in the case of non-woven or fibrous materials like paper, you know, slipping webs will generate a lot of dust and uh, fiber buildup, which can cause machine stops later. So with that introduction, there's, there is a limit to how much web tension uh, a roller can sustain in terms of a difference on either side. And that's known as uh, the capstan equation or sometimes called the band break equation fairly easy equation. Um, it just basically says there is a ratio of, of, the, of a high tension and low tension, which can be on either side of the roller, upstream or downstream. In this case, I'm showing it uh, downstream. And if you exceed this ratio, which is, is uh, related to E to the coefficient of friction times the wrap angle on the roller, then the web is going to slip. And in MapleSim, uh, they have created a basically a, a measurement or a calculation for this ratio for each uh, roller that you can call on as a sensor. And this tension ratio parameter uh, basically is output in the model where if a tension ratio more than that ratio is exceeded, a one the number one will be output, which means the web slips. And if it's zero, the web does not slip. So in this simple example, with just a three span um, process, really two spans, if you include just the two rollers, you have uh, an unwind roll, you have a driven roller with a fairly low wrap angle in span one, and you have a nip roller, a driven nip roller in span two. There is a speed difference between those two in this simulation. The, the downstream nip is driven faster than the upstream nip or upstream roller. And what we'd like to see is what, what does the model say about uh, slippage on this first roller? And if we go to the, the output of this simulation, the first thing to look at <clears throat> is the upper left hand corner, the plot for this capstan summary limit is one throughout the entire 10 second simulation. So as you might have suspected with the speed difference and the uh, brake torque on that unwind, you basically have a tension ratio that exceeds what that roller can sustain. And so the web slips continuously. And you can see in the plots of the tension in uh, the nip span and the driven roller span that there's a considerably higher tension in that nip span, about more than four times that of the tension in the uh, upper right-hand corner plot. So you're exceeding that, that ratio. So if you wanted to reduce that slippage or say the duration of the slippage, you know, what could, what could you test? So in this simple example, we're increasing the, the speed of the initial roller to, to a higher speed. And we're going to increase the coefficient of friction on that roller considerably, say with a, a new coating, if you were going to simulate that. Um, and now if we look at this capstan summary limit, the slip duration, instead of being the full 10 seconds, is more like a third of a second. So a considerable improvement in that. And now if we look at these tensions in the two spans, they're much more similar. That's a little over 300 Newtons 
for the NIP span and about 250. Um, so what else could we do to test how to reduce this slippage? Well, this is a lot easier to do in a simulation than maybe than in reality, but that's a good reason to do it because you would not want to make a machine change, an expensive machine change without knowing whether it might work. So in this case, this simply change the, the wrap angle on that initial roller to a much uh, higher wrap angle. And then I sped up the initial roller to be the same speed as the nip roller. And now we see that slip duration is even further reduced. And now the, the tensions in those two spans is effectively equal. And that slippage at the beginning is pretty much uh, an inertial effect um, that, that happens at the start of the simulation. So let's, let's go on to another example. Uh, one, of the, one of my early bosses told me that you can't push a rope when it comes to web handling, which makes sense. Uh, so you can have a certain low tension uh, on the low end, but too low um, can actually cause things like roll wraps and then the web can break out. Um, you can have more steering or lateral variation in the position of a web with particularly low tension. Um, certain types of web handling wrinkles uh, are actually made better by increasing tension because you stiffen the web. Uh, so low web tension can actually cause some wrinkles in some cases. And when we think about where you might get low web tension in a web path, one source can be uh, a case where you have just too many idler rollers in series. And why that is, is each of these idlers has uh, bearings, sometimes with lubrication in them, that um, is a certain torque that has to be overcome <clears throat> by the web itself. And this equation uh, is, this first equation is just showing that there is some sort of static torque to get the roller to move initially. And then because of uh, viscous effects, uh, sometimes increasing speed, you will see a relationship in this case, uh, a linear one with rotational velocity. So the faster you go, the more uh, torque that you're going to need to overcome the, this bearing drag. And because of this bearing drag, there is a tension loss uh, due to, to these bearings in the second equation on this page. Uh, which basically shows that as uh, the web speed increases again, you're going to see a greater tension loss. That's just a little bit of the theory. If we think about an example where you might have a number of rollers in series, uh, an accumulator is a, is, is a common example. Um, in this simulation, uh, or in, in general, accumulators are often used to store web for things like zero speed splices. Uh, and so the accumulator goes from a low position um, and, and goes up with a movable carriage to increase the span lengths in each of these spans to store web so that when the web needs to be stopped to make a splice, it has web to pull from almost like a storage tank. Um, so this simulation, we have an unwinding roll, a driven nip at the entry of this accumulator. We have a driven nip at the exit of this accumulator and a rewinding roll. So this particular simulation is going to do something like this, where it starts in a closed position. It's going to fill. After a few seconds, you'll see some of the rollers stop moving in order to allow that to fill. It will reach its peak and then it will come back down and you'll see some entry rollers stop in order to allow the web to, to feed out of the accumulator. So a fairly complex movement. Um, this was all built with this model in MapleSim using the library. So it starts with the web properties on the uh, upper left corner of that simulation. 
then we have our unwind, we have the driven uh, roller coming, driven nip coming into the, to the accumulator. We have a capstan summary limit output on this entry idler. Uh, we have a tension sensor. We have the carriage assembly with uh, a motor to drive that. There is a motion profile set of blocks that basically coordinates the all the driven rollers and the carriage. And we've got the exit nip, a tension on the exit uh, after the going into that exit nip and a rewind. So, um, and then the carriage itself was represented with some of the mechanical elements fairly simply and web spans that connect all of these elements. So fits on one page, <laughs> fortunately. So let's look at the output. In this case, we only had uh, measured the tension at the entry roller and at the exit nip. And you can see some of the, the peaks and valleys of this, which are related to the starting and stopping of the, of the entry and exit rollers and also the movement and the inertia of the carriage. So uh, you can see the startup from, from zero through the 70 second simulation. And in general, you see that the tension is lower um, at that entry roller than at the exit. And that's again, related to all the tension loss related to the idlers. Uh, you, so in most cases, the, the tension is lower and you can see it's about 465 Newtons. But let's say, for example, this accumulator has been running for quite a while, the bearings are starting to get dirty uh, and we'd like to understand how will this thing behave not just when it's brand new or after it's you know worn in, after the bearings have worn in, but as we start to achieve the wear out cycle or contamination of the bearings, what might happen. So let's, in the next uh, simulation, let's double the, the bearing drag that we had uh, as an input to this model and see what happens. And now you see the, the tension, instead of being 465 Newtons, at the entry, it's it's dropped to 426. You also see that it's consistently lower everywhere at that entry roller than at the exit. And there's a, a greater, if you look at the lower left corner of the plot, there's a little bit of a essentially a zero tension uh, portion. So you almost have slack web at the beginning. Uh, on that entry roller because of the doubling. So that might not be good from a, uh, a breakout standpoint or other kind of uh, tension dynamic issue. But these are the kinds of uh, things you can do what if studies with uh, using the simulation to understand the robustness of your particular process. And this is a plot of that capstan ratio parameter you can see Indeed, for about a second, the web is slipping on that entry roller uh, because of that low tension. So let's switch gears to our, our next example. Uh, commonly, if things are, uh, well, anytime you're joining webs, multiple webs together in a lamination, um, curl and puckers can, can occur for a variety of reasons. Uh, one reason is you join, uh, in this example, a couple of layers together where they're basically starting at different lengths so they have different strains when you stretch them to the same length or you stretch the short one to the same length as the long layer. And when you let go of those, if they're joined together, it will curl towards the, the shorter side. So the strain of the web and the webs um, not being matched at lamination can cause you some curl or puckering. You can also have, you know, things like humidity or temperature changes from one layer to another. Um, you can have shrinkage of a, of a uh, or curing of a coating um, differently on one layer than another. So there's, there's a number of different reasons for, for curl occurring. 
So let's take a look at one example in uh, using the library, the web handling library. In this example, we have three webs. Uh, they have different modulus, which is the slope of the stress strain curve, sort of the, uh, the slope of that. Uh, in this case, the top web is the highest modulus web. The lowest modulus web is in between web number two. It's half the modulus. And web three is in between those two. But in this initial example, uh, we're going to pull all these webs uh, with the lamination nip and wind up this laminate on a winding roll. And we're going to have start off with the same breaking torque on each unwind. And they're all the same, all equal and constant during the simulation. So here's how this gets represented in Maple Sims web handling library. We have the three webs, web one, two, and three. They each have a break on the unwind with a fixed uh, breaking torque. They come together into a lamination nip. Each web has its own property block. And then there is a laminated web property block, which basically uses a rule of mixtures uh, formulation to calculate what this laminated web property is going to be. And then we run it into a rewind and we can look at things like the, the strain at this lamination nip as an output in the simulation. So let's look at, take a look at this in this 20 second simulation. You see some uh, transient behavior there at the beginning. Um, because of the, the way the rolls are being ramped, uh, we get a peak in the strain. We're outputting the actual web strain here, um, which is something nice you can do in a simulation. Uh, and you can see that there's a difference in strain at this combining point. Uh, web two having the highest strain, web one having the lowest strain. Um, this model isn't going to predict curl, but it is going to say that you don't have equal strain at combining. Uh, and that may be something you want to try to fix. So in order to account for all the different moduli of these webs, we can try reducing the breaking torque uh, by half for web two. We could reduce it by one quarter for web three. And let's just see if the simulation gives us what we would expect, which is yes, because we've matched the strains now, uh, because we've accounted for the different moduli that we have in the simulation, we are effectively at, a, at an equal strain at combining. So let's go to our uh, last example. Uh, a very common issue with webs is that because they are typically much thinner than they are in width or in length, obviously, uh, they can be thought of sometimes as thin plates or shells. And they're very prone to buckling when they get compressive stress on them. The troughs that we, if we use the term trough, that's a term that has been used by some in the industry to describe these sort of out of plane waves that you can see in a web in an open span. And they might disappear when they go over a roller. Rollers have a very slight um, spreading effect. And so sometimes they appear to be relatively harmless in an open span. They won't travel over the roller into the next span. But they're kind of like a canary in a coal mine. You know, if you see troughs, um, you're, you've introduced some stresses on the web, which could lead to wrinkles. Um, wrinkles are troughs, we say, that actually travel over a roller. They go out of plane, they stay out of plane on the roller, and they show up in the downstream span. Um, so they're, they're typically uh, a worst case. Of a, of a trough. Now, these troughs and wrinkles are caused typically by compressive stresses laterally. Um, 
and they can come from many sources. Um, and we're going to talk about two of those with, with cases in this simulation software. Uh, one way is that you can simply over tension a web. You, you pull on it in the machine direction and because of Poisson effects and neck down as it is called by some, uh, you get some contraction of the web in the cross machine direction and that can cause out of plane uh, waves in the web. Another case that's very common is uh, troughs or wrinkles that occur from shear stresses that come from misaligned rollers. Typically, we want rollers to be parallel, their axis of rotation to be parallel in order to track the web straight and as well not introduce shear stresses that lead to shear wrinkles. So let's see what we can learn using the simulation. From theory developed at Oklahoma State University, uh, one researcher there uh, derived the trough amplitude and wavelength of a tensioned web. So if you pull on a web, uh, very uh, high stresses, you can generate these out of plane waves and the researcher calculated what kind of regular waves you would generate, what the wavelength of these waves would be, and what their amplitude or out of plane dimension would be. And in these equations, you think, see things that matter like the span length, the thickness of the web, how much stress you're putting on it in the machine direction, how stiff it is, you know, it's modulus in the cross machine direction. Um, and then these Poisson ratios, which uh, dictate how, how much the web will change in dimension when it's um, changed in another dimension. So these can be calculated uh, for each span. Uh, some research researchers who did this kind of uh, calc these calculations in finite element models found that if they exceed, if this amplitude to wavelength ratio gets really high, what that's effectively saying is that you are getting very tall um, troughs or wrinkles relative to their spacing. And if you think of it, it's kind of a very unstable loop that can fall over on itself. And if it falls over on itself and crosses a roller, that becomes a fold over that is very difficult or very difficult to, to remove. So we want to avoid these high um, amplitude to wavelength ratios, theoretically. Well, this big scary equation is was also derived at Oklahoma State, but what it is trying to show is what is the misalignment angle that you would need to induce troughing in a web. And it has a lot of um, parameters in it, but basically it comes down to things like the web properties, you know, how thick the web is, how stiff it is, how much tension are you putting on the web, the span length and the um, various other parameters related to the critical buckling stress that it's going to take to generate a trough from this misalignment. Um, the nice thing about uh, a computer program is you can put this kind of equation in it and let it do the calculation and the hard work for you. And that's what we did with this particular case. We wanted to look at just a fairly simple web path. Uh, it has a driven roller. All the blue rollers in this um, simulation are driven. So we have uh, a driven roller in span three. We have a nip in span six, and we have a driven nip in span 11. Um, the other rollers are idler rollers in this uh, simulation. It's a 20 second simulation. We ramp up the speed of all these rollers at different uh, rates and different uh, final speeds. And we can look at the tension as an output. We can look at this amplitude to wavelength ratio. And we can look at 
the roller misalignment angle that would be needed to generate a trough in each span. Now, to understand sort of the robustness of this particular web path and see how might it do with different types of materials, um, we have two example webs that we want to run this simulation with. The first, uh, which is a higher modulus, a stiffer web, is a polyester film. Uh, you could see in the table there, we've got its thickness, its width, its machine direction modulus, it's cross machine direction modulus and a Poisson ratio. And then we have a very different web, uh, a polypropylene non-woven um, with much different properties in terms of stiffness, uh, much lower modulus than the polyester film. So let's take a look at the outputs of this simulation for these two different webs. But first, uh, again, showing how this is represented in the library, it's fairly basic. You've got um, an unwind and the rollers uh, connected together with spans. In each um, span, we put a sensor in there to measure the uh, trough roller misalignment angle. Um, so we created basically a sensor and we created custom a custom component to do that trough calculation from misalignment angle. Uh, we also uh, calculate the amplitude and the wavelength with uh, another custom calculation and we'll output that as well. So this is a, a case for the uh, polyester web. I believe that's the polyester web. Um, and it's just showing the tension transient and the fact that you have uh, different ramp up rates of the different rollers and you have a little bit of a transient there at the beginning. But it does settle out here by, you know, about 16 seconds. We're basically at, at steady state. Now, this is the trough amplitude to wavelength ratio for the polyester film. And I said on the earlier slide that uh, if we exceed 0 0.05 for this ratio, that might be a watch out. Um, for this stiff web, for the tensions that we had input and the roller speeds, uh, it appears that all of these ratios are okay. They're all lower than that limit. Um, so we might not expect you know, any uh, troughing to occur for this particular web with this particular setup. Now for the, the polypropylene nonwoven, we can look at the tensions. It's a similar shape to the simulation, but the tensions are much lower. Um, we see that the tension in span four is, is pretty low, uh, but not zero at steady state. And now if we look at the trough to amplitude ratio for this lower modulus web, though, uh, we see that there are several spans. In fact, most spans are above 0 0.05, and some are above 0 0.075, uh, which is a particularly uh, troubling sign that perhaps the tension, if you were to basically just swap out a polypropylene nonwoven web for a polyester web in this web path without making any changes, you're going to run into some problems with over tensioning and troughing and most likely wrinkles occurring just from having too high a tension. Um, so we can simulate, well, what would we want to do to try to fix this? So we can Un, we can reduce things like the unwind breaking torque, and we can slow down the first uh, driven roller and the exit nip speeds as a as a case study. And we can see the the tensions are even lower now, two to twenty newtons versus in the forty newton range for the high end, still above zero in span seven on the tension. And now the the all of these spans are now below that highest 0 0.075 amplitude to wavelength ratio um, 
there's still some above 0 0.05, so we still might have more work to do, but we've certainly made it made it better for that particular web. So let's switch now to the roller misalignment angle. How much misalignment can this web tolerate? And of course, we're not just getting a single value, we're getting the entire 20 second simulation. So you can see if there's a particular part of the ramp that is more uh, or less uh, tolerant of misalignment. And in this case, in general, the uh, misalignment angles are pretty small of what you could tolerate before generating troughs. Um, there's a rule of thumb just found in research researching and testing by Oklahoma State that um, about twice the misalignment angle to generate a trough is what would generate a wrinkle. So you can see that about a tenth of a degree or tenths of a degree matter for this web with respect to uh, misalignment and generating wrinkles. So for this very stiff web, misalignment is going to be uh, something to really watch out for. For the polypropylene nonwoven, its, uh, its properties allow for a little bit more misalignment. It's more up around the, the one degree instead of a tenth of a degree. Although you do see one span sticking out there, span four seems to be more sensitive. So that's one of the other benefits of this is maybe you can see uh, which of your spans are more intolerant to misalignment than others, at least in, a, in this simulation. If we go and we look at the case where we lowered the, the uh, tensions uh, in the polypropylene nonwoven, now we see that you have a few spans getting down, particularly span seven is now in the 0.2 uh, degree misalignment range. So uh, lowering that tension made at least one span more sensitive to misalignment. And it's all because of you know different span lengths and different tensions in these different spans. So it's not a singular value. It can change with different conditions. And that's the kind of thing you can explore with uh, this simulation. So to summarize, obviously I've only touched on a few uh, common issues that can happen with web handling. And there are many just because of the, the very thin nature of, a, of the material, the fact of the speeds that uh, are needed to be run to, to economically convert webs into products. And um, so success is going to depend in web handling on how these web and machine interactions are handled. And hopefully I've shown you that the Maple Sims web handling library uh, enables understanding and solving some web handling challenges. These are some references um, that I use that, that refer to some of those equations uh, and other information from the presentation with uh, hyperlinks for all of those. And finally, if something sparked a question that doesn't get answered today and you'd like to know more, um, here's my contact information if you would like to to uh, ask me a question. But we have time now for questions. Thank you, Steve. That was uh, really uh, amazing to see how what started out as, as theoretical research from the uh, Oklahoma um, state was really transformed into some really practical applications because that's that's often a, a challenge when people are, are looking at, at the the scary equations to to your point. you know it's it's the the application afterwards is is where it really comes through. Um, so just while we uh, wait for a couple of the questions to come through, um, if just a reminder, if you have a question for Steve, um, please uh, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type it in there. Uh, we will read it out uh, for, for, um, for him to, uh, to respond to. And uh, just to, while we're waiting for that, uh, Steve, um, there's, I did notice that um, with um, 
with a number of the cases, like you had situations where you were modeling um, the idle bearing drag, like so something that's fairly, fairly um, uh, common, but at the same time uh, can be kind of hard to to quantify. Is that something that could then be used instead of just at the design stage to actually mirror the production environment to sort of see why are things not working the way that that you expect them to be? Um, it, does that to start to 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 give other opportunities for using these models? Yes. So um, what you would need to do that, say, on an existing machine is obviously you'd have to have the the bearing the actual bearing drag uh, of of each roller. And there are ways to do that, to measure those things. Uh, typically a, a spin down test is done on a roller where you're, you uh, accelerate, accelerate a roller up to a, a, a known RPM level and you basically time how long it takes for the roller to spin down. And from that, there are equations that can be used to calculate the actual bearing drag. So now once you have that actual bearing drag in your simulation, you could then go in and input that very specific bearing drag for every roller that you measured to get a very accurate um, sense of what will happen during the dynamics of, of a ramp up or a ramp down. So, but you do have to have the the input in these models, you know, we made assumptions as to what the bearing drag would be. Um, typically, you might have a brand new idler that that you measure one of them, and you use that for all of them. But of course, over time, the bearing bearings change and wear differently or get contaminated differently. That's fair, yeah. Because the uh, the the production model can <laughs> can vary have a lot of different factors. A lot of the assumptions you start with and then refine them later, I guess. Yeah. Um, just another question that's um, that's come through. Um, in terms of the um, there was one of the diagrams had a multi span web paths. So I think it had like about ten or eleven different rollers. So we using the modeling system. Was that complicated to build? Was that like a matter of days or, or weeks? Uh, given that often oh, people yeah. going from no, the, it's it's um, um, yeah. Basically, what you have to do is just click and drag uh, the roller type onto the page, and then you affix um, the basically the element that fixes its position in space, and then you connect it with a span. You connect it to the next roller with a span. So if, if you look on that page, most of the models had, let's say, 20 or 30 elements. It might take uh, a few seconds to do each element. Uh, you know, so it, it's, I'd say, a half an hour to build an initial model, depending on the complexity of the, the model that you're trying to do. And then, of course, you, you launch into all the what if questions about what do I want to do uh, to understand this thing or make it better? But the initial um, construction is a click and drag affair, you know, that depends on the number of elements that you have that you're trying to represent. Right, but suddenly it sounds like it's less effort than, than trying to re recreate a, an, an FE uh, model of, of the, of the Oh, yeah, web, right? in terms of <laughs> finite element model, yes, it's much quicker than, than a finite element model would be. And it's certainly a lot quicker the, in a lot of cases than running the physical experiment. Uh, yeah, you know, the phys physical experiment means you have to get time in your plant, which takes away from production or if your pilot plant, if you have one also, you have to you know, jockey for time on a physical machine, you have to calibrate all your instruments, you have to get the raw material, you know, it's, um, it's, it's much easier to, uh, to generate it in a simulation and learn, at least as a first step um, before just launching into an expensive physical experiment. That's bad, yeah, yeah. Um, if there's any other questions, just uh, type them into the Q&A. Uh, we are answering a few of them online, so uh, um, in, in, in the chat directly, um, just as uh, one response. Um, does this software allow uh, it to easily modify or change web paths according to the machines that are in the plants? And uh, the response was uh, the library and the interface uh, is, is fairly easy to make those changes right on the uh, 
the modeling software. Um, but obviously, the more complicated the model and the, the more complicated the, the system that you're trying to simulate, the, uh, the, the more com complex the, uh, the effort and the, uh, the model becomes with uh, trying to capture everything that's going on. Yeah. Um, just uh, in, while we're um, wrapping, coming to, near to the top of the hour, is there any thoughts, uh, Steve, in terms of um, the, the applications for um, the control angle? So using, you had one example like with the dancer where you're a fairly straightforward control loop. Um, what, it, what are the challenges with getting a, a response from the controller that will respond in time to be able to be used by the simulation? Have you seen uh, that's a bit of a challenge with the industry at large? Um, you mean in a physical system or in the simulation? In the physical system. I mean, it, the control of roller speeds and uh, dancers and accumulators is extremely important for web handling because very small differences in speed can lead to very big differences in either tension or strain in position. So you see a lot of uh, servo motor controls and um, very, you know, PI loops that are used to um, maintain the roller speeds very accurately. And those kinds of things can be, are, you know, simulated in this software, as far as I can tell so far, they're definitely, um, it gives you the ability to uh, go a fairly wide range of how simple or how complicated you want to simulate your control system. Thanks. Um, there's just one question came in about you know that you used with the with the variables that you were modeling. Um, the, you had the the uh, the tension and the, the strain and the, the drive um, uh, torque and things like that. Was was there other factors and parameters that that um, that you could see uh, being modeled in a similar way uh, beyond that, uh, like wrap angles? I think was in one one diagram. Well, the, the wrap angles are calculated by the simulation um, because you, you define the position of the roller in space and the, the wrap angle is an output of the simulation in, the, in this case. Uh, I see other questions coming in asking about things like, um, can you simulate shear stress or can you simulate the uh, cross direction position of the web? Um, that same equation that I showed for uh, measuring the misalignment angle, there is an output from that same uh, research that will give you the lateral position shift that will happen for a given uh, misalignment. So uh, that's a, a steady state, you know, shift that would happen for a given misalignment. Um, so I, I know that would be would be possible um, with respect to shear stress. Again, these same, um, some of these same simulation or the same equations and research calculate things like the shear stresses and other stress outputs that I, you know, just didn't create a custom component for. Uh, so it, it just depends on whether the theory, you know, exists, the actual mathematical theory exists. If it does, it can be represented either in Maple, which is a different product or within this simulation directly. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, that's fair. Um, and just as we, we come close to the, the end of the time we have together, um, uh, we, I do see some more questions that are, they're mainly being answered online. So hopefully uh, we can get to the specifics of those uh, and please follow up with us if uh, at MapleSoft if you have any specific um, uh, cases that you want to envision. Um, now, I do know that there, the, the, the MapleSim web handling library is is uh, is is constantly being worked on and developed with new features and, and things coming in. Uh, you know, on a, on a, uh, several times a year, there's there's updates with that, and that's uh, that's quite an exciting place to be at for something that's that's relatively new to the industry. So, um, just to to kind of close on through any any final thoughts, Steve, before we uh, we close the time together. I, I would just say that um, it's it's been a privilege to to have a chance to use this software and um, ha having had a long career in web handling, it's, it's exciting to see, you know, what you can do with it.